hello there. The weather has been just terrible uh, recently and I haven't been able to get out and do any walking. Every time I look at the BBC weather forecast every day for the next two weeks, it's, it's wet. <laughs> what, what is going on? Um, so I thought I'd uh, do a, 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 just a short video having a brief look at the history of Scottish prisons. Um, what I, do, I thought I'd do with this is I thought I'd start the video in a cell and end the video in a cell and the rest will be voice over. I've come through to Stirling because you've got the um, you've got a toll booth which I think has a cell in it. You've got uh, the jail, Stirling jail, and you've also got a military prison in the castle which has cells. Hello there, no you're okay, on you go. Uh, and I come through just for that reason. I've got a, a, a huge choice of uh, cells to, to kind of do my bit. But they were all shut. <laughs> um, I mean, it's just after the new year. Maybe it's to be expected, but I thought we were back to normal. So I found uh, a lovely uh, hotel here. Uh, I'll put the name of this hotel at the bottom of the screen. It's a lovely, it used to be an old school. Very grand affair. It must be really nice to stay here. And I thought, I'll just start the video here and then the video here. So, uh, Scottish prisons are prison. Just a place where you get, go to get locked up. Um, I mean, I thankfully never spent any time in prison. Uh, although I, I did uh, spend one night in a police cell. Uh, in a, a police station just just down a close off the high street in Edinburgh, near, near the Market Cross. I think that police station's shut now. This was in the early 1970s. And um, I'll spare you all the details, but let's just say it was uh, the result of a drug fueled adventure that went badly wrong. And um, while I was totally away with the fairies, as you might say, I, I do remember being in that police cell and suddenly realising that, realising that the door to the cell was locked. I mean, you would expect the door to a police cell to be locked. But as I say, I wasn't quite with it. And uh, when I discovered it was locked, I, it came as a bit of a shock. I thought, I am locked in here. I can't get out. I was locked up. And it's really not an experience I would ever wish to repeat. The first prisons were in castles. In the old days, back in the early medieval period, wrongdoers were dealt with by the lord of the manor. Punishment was meted out in his castle. If you were lucky, you'd be thrown into a dank dungeon under the castle, and if unlucky, you'd be taken to a nearby hillock and hanged. If you look at maps, there is often a gallows hill near an old castle. But as the years went by, areas of habitation grew away from the immediate vicinity of castles, and villages and towns developed, each requiring their own facilities for dealing with lawbreakers. Some castles built their own jail, mainly for unruly soldiers. The image at the start of this video, for example, shows a cell door at Edinburgh Castle's military prison. But in growing towns, buildings called tollbooths were created. They were the town hall of their day, performing a number of tasks essential to the workings of the borough, like the collection of taxes. They also contained a court and jail. Toll booths were usually located in a prominent area of a town, like the main or high street. This is Stirling's old toll booth. Other fine examples can be seen in the likes of Sanquar, Kirkudbury and Lauder. With the arrival of toll booths in towns, 
capital punishment was no longer carried out on a scenic hillside in the countryside. Hangings and beheadings moved to the high street and became a source of entertainment. Huge crowds would gather around the likes of Edinburgh's old tollbooth to witness the gory end of a felon's life. Here at Stirling Tollbooth, for example, during excavations around the year 2000, the skeleton of Alan Mayer was uncovered. In 1843, at the age of 84, he was hanged for beating his wife to death. And this is the death mask of Robert Smith, a 19-year-old labourer convicted of murder, rape and robbery in 1868 and sentenced to death at Dumfries. He was the last person to be hanged in public in Scotland. By the 19th century, Tolbooths could no longer cope with the number of folk that needed locking up and conditions within many were appalling. Indeed, in 1841, Scotland's first inspector of prisons described Stirling's Tolbooth as the worst prison in Britain, a statement that no doubt led to the building of a new prison nearby. Populations exploded during the Industrial Revolution, and hand-in-hand hand with this went an increase in the number of people committing crime. Prisoner numbers in the UK went from around 5,000 in 1800 to around 20,000 in 1840. Dedicated prisons were being built in towns all over the country, their sole function being to house criminals. But it took time for some existing issues to be sorted. During a period in their past when children could be sent up chimneys to give them a sweep, children as young as six years of age could also be sent to prison. You can see those juvenile wings in many prison plans. It wasn't until the late 19th century that this issue began to be addressed. This is Stirling's old jail, built in 1847, not far from the Tolbooth. It's perhaps not just as large as some Victorian town prisons, but then Stirling wasn't as large as, say, Glasgow or Edinburgh. As you can perhaps see, it has a bit of a castle look about it. Many Victorian prisons look like castles. The stout stone construction of a castle was a symbol of power, and this look in a purpose-built prison made it perfectly clear that you were now in the hands of the lords of the manor, or town council and judiciary. Many of these prisons had gateways that were not only designed to be a stout barrier to freedom, but to intimidate prisoners as they entered and wave goodbye to freedom. Dumfries Prison is a good example. Old maps and town plans can often give us a glimpse inside some of these prisons. This is Perth Prison, for example, in 1860. You can see various sections used to contain different types of prisoner. There's a juvenile prison, for, as I've previously said, locking up children as young as six, an imbecile prison and a lunatic prison. Presumably the rest of the prison was used to contain folk who were just bad. A town plan of a similar date gives us more detail, everything from a surgeon's house and a dead house to an imbecile room and a milk house. Some 1960s photos of Perth Prison show a structure and layout similar to the cell blocks in the likes of Partick's or Govan's old police stations, just bigger. And although the cells were a little different in size and shape to 19th century cells, 
probably because some of them were 19th century cells. The addition of a pair of curtains could make them look a bit more comfortable. This side-by-side -side image shows what little of the jail in the 1860s map on the left has survived in the prison today, as shown on the right. Paisley's old prison is another that looked a lot like a castle. It once stood by the white cart water, behind the court and police office of the county buildings, right where the western section of the Piazza shopping centre is now. The jail was in operation from 1823 when, as was generally the case, prisoners were transferred there from the old Tolbooth. It was expanded in the mid-19th century, but closed in 1883 when the government decided that centralisation was the way forward and many small prisons could be replaced by a bigger one, like Berlini in Glasgow, which opened in the 1880s. Paisley Jail was eventually demolished in the 1960s, Yet another architecturally interesting building demolished to make way for a bland shopping mall. Small town jails that closed around that time include Dumbarton Prison, closed in 1883, Jedburgh Castle Jail in 1886, and Greenock Prison, closed in 1910. Many of these prison buildings were either repurposed or simply lay unused, sometimes for many years, before being demolished. New prisons were being built and existing prisons enlarged, but the general trend was for centralisation and to group more and more prisoners together in larger jails. It was, of course, a tad easier dealing with an increasing number of prisoners if you just shipped them abroad and forgot about them. Stick them on a ship bound for Australia or North America and you no longer have to house, feed or worry about them. Between 1787 and 1868, about 7,000 men, women and children were transported to Australia. Prison records at Inverary Jail, now a visitor attraction, show that a John Boyle was sentenced to 14 years transportation for uttering and using forged notes. The range of offences that existed in the old days was huge, everything from the most minor infringement of the law to murder. The prison records of Inverary Jail also include one Peter Macaulay, aged 39, who was sentenced to three days' imprisonment or a ten shillings fine in 1879 for the theft of a duck. Their records also show that a Margaret Sinclair, aged 33, was sentenced to 14 days' imprisonment in 1855 for the theft of a turnip. A map dating to 1866 showing Aberdeen's East Prison is quite interesting. You can see cells and airing yards, but you can also see just one cell on its own, right beside the burial ground. I'm guessing, but I imagine this is probably the condemned cell where those sentenced to death would stay before being executed. The fact that it is right beside the burial ground is, well, convenient for disposal of the body afterwards. And I imagine the gallows were probably right there too. The death penalty was abolished in 1965, and the last hanging in Scotland was at Craig Inch's prison in Aberdeen in 1963, when Henry Burnett was hanged for murder.
Calton Jail in Edinburgh was a fairly large prison. Indeed, it was once the largest prison in Scotland. It sat right where St Andrew's house is now, below Calton Hill, and yet again it resembled a castle, so much so that at the time it could easily be confused for Edinburgh Castle. It was in existence from around 1790, went through any number of transformations and expansions, and closed in 1925, when it could no longer cope with prisoner numbers, and was replaced by Sockton Prison on the outskirts of Edinburgh, which opened in 1919. During the First World War, it was described by prisoners as the worst prison in Scotland, with the cold chill of a grim fortress. Plans of the prison dating to 1794 show various separate sections for the likes of female vagrants, male vagrants, debtors, male convicts, female convicts, male felons and female felons. Burke and Hare, the notorious 19th century grave robbers and murderers, were imprisoned here. To this day, the bodies of ten convicted murderers lie buried below what is now the West Car Park of St Andrew's House, placed there after execution. They include Eugene Marie Chantrell, hanged in 1878 for murdering his wife by gas poisoning, and Jessie King, the last woman to be hanged in Edinburgh in 1889 for murdering unwanted children. The only visible remains of the jail is the governor's house, which sits prominently on the skyline, and the door to the death cell, which can be seen upstairs in the Beehive Inn in the grass market. Another of the larger Scottish prisons that is no longer with us is Duke Street Prison in Glasgow. It opened in 1798, was variously expanded over the years, and described in 1841 as Scotland's only well-managed prison. In 1882, most male prisoners were sent to the new prison at Berlini, and Duke Street became largely a women's prison. A few cells were retained for male prisoners. It closed in 1955. This photo, dating to 1855, shows two prisoners on the left and a warder on the right. The prisoners were accused of housebreaking and probably being taken to Duke Street Prison. In this 1850s map we can see the prison and its location, but we can't see much detail. However... This town plan of 1857 really lets us look inside to see what those buildings were actually used for. You can see female cells in the old prison, possibly part of the original 1798 prison, perception cells and an oakum storehouse. In the 19th century prisoners were often put to work. Sometimes this work would be meaningless like the endless turning of a handle on a crank machine that made nothing and served no purpose other than to be a form of punishment. Other prisoners were put to work picking oakum. Lengths of rope could be laboriously unpicked and unravelled. The resultant fibres could then be used between planks of wood to make ships watertight. The only thing left of Duke Street Prison is some boundary wall and the Cathedral House Hotel, which was once the premises of the Discharged Prisoners' Aid Society. Here we can see a released convict applying for aid right here in 1909. Today, Barlini Prison still exists, as does the prison at Perth. In total, there are 15 prisons in Scotland housing something like 8,000 prisoners. And, as has always been the case, there is simply not enough capacity to cope with an increasing number of prisoners. 
the result being that two prisoners can at times share a cell intended for just one. But then, I suppose it's better than being thrown in a dank castle dungeon. A few of those early small prisons that closed are now open to the public as visitor attractions. Today you can see what life was once like in the prisons of old in the likes of Stirling Old Town Jail, Jedburgh Castle Jail and Museum, Peterhead Prison Museum and Inverary Jail. So that was my uh, brief uh, look at a history of Scottish prisons. I hope you enjoyed it. Fascinating subject. Prisons have changed greatly over the centuries. And you're no longer thrown in a, a damp pit at the foot of a castle. Um, I mean, an example of the sort of changes that have taken place over the years is that... Um, the prison guards or wardens no longer carry cutlasses or swords as they once did in the likes of uh, Peterhead's old prison. And I think, you know, you would perhaps think twice about misbehaving as a prisoner if you thought you might get your arm cut off with a cutlass. <laughs> um, and obviously, I mean... These days, prisoners can sort of decorate their cells. They can stick up a pair of curtains, some posters on the wall, and have various bits and bobs that perhaps make their cell look and feel a bit more homely. But at the end of the day, it is still a cell. In many cases, it's probably still a Victorian cell. And um, you are still locked up. Things don't really change that much. I'm Eddie Burns. Bye for now.